right, five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. The other day, somebody shared on Facebook a video of uh, a lady, in, in uh, I think she was in Germany, and uh, she was the passenger in a car, and she had a little boy on her lap, and, and um, there was a man taking the video. I guess he was the driver, and I can't remember what was the animal. Was it a giraffe or something? Well, some kind of an animal was uh, kept poking his head in and, and licking their ice cream cone. Oh, I think it was a giraffe. And just, just, it was so funny to watch us little boys giggling, 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 and the mom is, oh my gosh, just giggling, giggling. The animal, and gosh, I just can't remember if it was a giraffe or not, but anyway, some animal was licking their ice cream cone, right? And then I see the woman take a bite of her ice cream cone. <laughs> And I'm oh, like, yeah. hello, a giraffe was just licking your ice cream cone. <laughs> yeah. Why are you putting your mouth on the same place? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is disgusting. Uh, Dr. Sadesh uh, Badisi is on the phone. I hope I said his name right. He is a doctor of veterinary medicine. He's got a lot of credentials. Holy mackerel. He's an associate professor of public health and preventive medicine and the assistant dean for the School of Graduate Studies at St. George's University School of Veterinary Medicine in Granada in the Caribbean. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, he's going cool. to talk to us about zoonotic diseases. I never heard that word before, but my notes here, thank you, Robin, say these are illnesses that are spread between animals and humans. Send this, wait a minute, send this lady this video after we've done this interview. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Sudesh Badisi, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, guys, and thank you for having me in your program. And uh, It's very interesting listening to your opening remarks for this session referring to the Facebook posting on the on the interaction between humans and animals. Yeah. Did you see that one by chance? No, but I was sitting look out for it. Oh my god. I mean it's funny to watch, but then the lady takes a she bites into her ice cream like there was no germs. Yeah. That was crazy. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, I think I think it's it's interesting because it it very much has relevance to our discussion on zoonotic diseases. Yeah. But just to provide some context, though, when we think of Facebook, when we think of all of the YouTube video clips, when we think about the the interesting parts of our daily lives, somehow there is always a strong association with an animal interaction. Yeah. I, 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 In fact. Go ahead. In, in North America, there are more households with pets than children today. So the evolution of how we are engaging animals as, 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 as a human society is in fact increasing our interaction. It's also increasing our humanization of animals at the same time. Absolutely. I know. I know what you're saying. So where, okay, first of all, where are you calling from? Are you actually in Granada right now? Yes, c calling from Grenada in the Caribbean. Grenada, okay. And, and is it hot there? It's uh, it's always hot there, isn't it? Well, well, actually, it's t we're we're sort of straggling between what we call the rainy season and the dry season. So we're on the tail end of the rainy season. So it's pretty moist. It's pretty cool currently. Okay, okay. But as we get closer into the summer, it's going to get drier and hotter. All right. Now I park my car underneath a tree. And at the end of the day, sometimes, well, last week especially, there was a lot of bird poop all over my car. <laughs> I'm telling you, the birds had a party, and and they were just pooping all over my car. So that that, that bird, those bird droppings could get me sick, couldn't they? Well, well, the first thing I might suggest is maybe find another place to park. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, but secondly, um, there is a pot potential. There's always a possibility for being exposed, especially to, to fecal material from animal. But it depends, though. It depends on, on the diet of the animal. It depends on what they're consuming. Because if, they, in fact, they're consuming healthy, then there may be a little residual effect on the, ex the excreta. But, but birds are known as other animal species that carry intrinsic microorganisms as part of their own flora. So this is normal for them. The same way we have organisms in our skin, in our GI tract, animals also share their own colonies of organisms. And there are some organisms in birds that are considered pathogenic to humans. One example will be a routine E. coli or salmonella, which is part of any type of, of fecal contamination. That's one part, but also birds can transmit some respiratory infections, which include cytokosis. So we, we must at least be cognizant of the risks that's involved, but for your purpose, there are two things that you have to be concerned about. One is, if you are in direct contact with the feces, let's say through your hand, 
your own hygiene and sanitation will mitigate that risk. Yeah. And also, if the feces is dry and it's dusty, then you have to be careful about your own exposure to your respiratory tract. So you have to ensure that be careful about any inhaling any dust or any type of debris around fecal material. So in a dry, hot day, when that fecal material becomes dusty, that's an area for you to be concerned about. Wow. Now, I don't want to make people paranoid, but should we start to take precautions? Because if I walk if I walk into the mall, they have dogs. People bring their dogs into yeah, the mall nowadays. Sure do. And grocery stores. Or are we being too paranoid? If I'm, In other words, I guess what I'm asking is this. Do we worry about the domestic animals, or should should we be more worried about the wild animals, or, or is there no difference? That's a very good question. I think that's a very important question and relevant to, to, your, to, your, to your listening audience as well. W- you have made the distinction between domestic animals and wild animals. Right. When we think about domestic animals, those animals that are born, that are housed, that are, that are living in our own human environment, these animals themselves have little or no exposure to other animals. That's the first thing. Right. We very much regulate their diets by virtue of processed foods, which comes with food safety and food quality assurance. In fact, these animals are more in line with, with, with human type of microorganisms than even sharing microbes with their own species. So there's a lot less risks that's involved as it relates to domestic animals when compared to wildlife. Furthermore, when we think about domestic animals, there's a lot of preventive approaches that we take, not only veterinary care, we vaccinate, we deworm, and there are a lot of measures that are focused on public health approaches towards human health protection that we institute as part of our veterinary care. So there's, there's significantly reduced risk in considering domestic animals as, a, as compared to wildlife. Now, from the wildlife perspective, we are increasingly becoming exposed to wildlife for many reasons. When we think about our citizen centers, and when we think about the expanding human population and our need to continue to identify urban areas, suburban areas, rural areas, we're getting close to the boundaries, sometimes even overlapping with the very same environment with the wildlife. An example in North America will be the issue of Lyme, of Lyme disease where the organism Borrelia burgdorferi is transmitted via ticks from deer. So deer, right, right, yeah. this is the reservoir. And why is that an issue now? Well, 30, 40 years ago, that was not an issue. But today, we are building housing dwellings and, and, and communities close to wildlife habitats. And the closer we get to wildlife, is the more likely the risk of exposure exists. So that's one aspect of wildlife. The other aspect from a domestic perspective is when we think about pets, pets of today are not your traditional dogs and cats and birds anymore. Pets of today include wildlife. And there are risks associated with wildlife that is now part of the domestic environment. Because wildlife does carry inherent intrinsic pathogens pathogens to humans, not necessarily pathogens to the wildlife, but pathogens to humans. And that's an area that we particularly have a concern about. And we have many examples around the world. West Nile virus in North America, and the U.S. is an example, where West Nile virus, as the name suggests, should belong to the River Nile region. Yeah. But, but we have West Nile from the east coast to the west coast of the U.S. today. And, and here in the uh, uh, United States, I mean, a lot of people do own exotic animals, and they have to apply for a special license to own these exactly. exotic animals. Exactly. An example of, of, of a concern with regards to why we need to maintain some type of quality assurance or enforcement or regulation for wildlife. As, as pets, wildlife do carry a lot of flora. Flora includes a lot of organisms like salmonella, like E. coli. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But salmonella and E. coli are not necessarily hazardous to the healthy adult human. However, when you think about the children and the elderly, those that are more susceptible in any given population. The elderly, because they're very much immunologically 
exhausted yeah, yeah. and children because they're immunologically naive they tend to to succumb to more of these health complications and wildlife in a home environment children are the ones that are more involved and have hands-on behavior sure. with these types of pets so we have to be very careful about children in particular and handling of wildlife and elderly i am not advocating for not Engaging wildlife. I'm not advocating for getting rid of your wildlife as pets. Right. I'm just advocating for understanding the risks but what and being educated towards preventive approaches. Okay, now I am not likely to go out and pet a tiger in the wild. I am not like here in, in Florida. By the way, we have some monkeys that live in the in the yep. forest here, mm-hmm. and I'm not likely to go out and pet those monkeys. However, I am likely to swim in the river. Mm-hmm. Where the alligators pee and the monkeys probably pee. Yeah. I mean, am, could I get a disease? Wild could board. I get an animal disease by going oh. into the river or the Certainly. lake? Certainly. And one prime example is leptospirosis, where the animals will secrete leptospiro organisms as part of their urine product. And that organism does survive in the watery, moist environment of a river, of a stream, for example. Uh And you, as a healthy adult, you can actually be in the river or the stream, and that organism has an ability to penetrate even your intact skin through your mucous membranes. Oh, my gosh. And leptospirosis is a disease that, well, it's it's blood-borne. It impacts your kidneys. It can have significant multi-organ are all, involvement. Of, are all of these considered zoonotic diseases? Is that what the, uh, the term means? It is. It is. So zoonotic diseases, as as the term, as the example provides, is any infectious disease which can be naturally transmitted between the vertebrate animals and humans. And in terms of what we know today, we currently are aware of more than 61% of all human infections that are, in fact, classified really? as a zoonotic disease. Yes. Oh, my God. We have many examples. Wow. If we were to, let's say, think about the past 10, 15 years, what were the diseases of most significant impact and importance? It was avian influenza, bird flu. It was sudden acquired respiratory syndrome, SARS, which was saw some corona-like virus in Southeast Asia from civet cats. It was swine flu, influenza type A, H1N1. It was Ebola. It was chikungunya, Zika. All of these diseases have animal sources that have spilled over from the animal species onto the human population. Did, um, there was a, I don't know if it's true or not, was AIDS originally an animal disease? Well, well, AIDS is part of what we call retroviruses, and every species of animal, including humans, have their own retroviruses. AIDS, which is caused by the HIV or the human immunodeficiency virus, is specific to humans. There is some type of relationship or close connection with regards to simian immunodeficiency virus, which is in non-human primates. Mm. But the HIV virus, as we are currently managing, has specific circulation to only within the human population. Uh, you have something that we were told you're doing called the One Health Movement? Yes, yes, exactly. So, so One Health is, is an approach... And zoonotic diseases is one of the main reasons why we need to advocate for One Health. And One Health recognizes the inextricable link of health between that of humans, animals, and the environment. And at St. George's University, we have schools of medicine, schools of veterinary medicine, arts and sciences, and graduate programs in public health. So... At St. George's University, we offer the academic programs. We conduct research in all areas of human, animal, and environmental health. So we very much focus on the One Health approach. And this approach is gaining traction because individual professions, individual scientific communities cannot address these health issues if, in fact, there is always that multi-determinant Wow. approach 
which requires a multidisciplinary approach, which One Health advocates for. All right, let me uh, ask you to just hang on just, uh, just a moment here, Doctor. Uh, we'll take a little break, and we'll be right back. By the way, I saw the phone line ringing, so, um, I, and I did not go to it because I wanted the doctor to get the word out. But if you have a question, you are invited to call in. Give me a, uh, about two minutes to take this break, and we'll be right back with Dr. Sadesh Badisi. Um, he's down in Grenada. By the way, it looks like a beautiful place. I looked at you yeah. I looked you up on Google <laughs> Earth, whatever you call that thing. Uh, we're talking about diseases that uh, people get from animals, and maybe vice versa, maybe Maybe animals get diseases from us. I don't know if that's part of this or not. They're called zoonotic, Z-O-O-N-O-T-I-C. If every question's, uh, this is a good time to call, I'll put you on hold till we come back. This is The Source, W-O-C-A Ocala. There are only a few things in life that you can be certain will always be around. Death, taxes, the pursuit of happiness, and computers. As they continue to advance at an epic pace, the one absolute certainty about them is that they'll break. It's not an if, it's a when. And when it happens, bring it to the only company in Ocala that's certified in Apple and Microsoft, Ocala Mac and PC Repair. They even offer on-site computer repair service, so they come to you. And if you do drop it off, you can check your repair status online. Ocala Mac and PC Repair is a family-owned and operated company that can do everything from mobile repair to wireless networks, fixing viruses, data recovery, even building and installing new systems. Visit online at ocalamacpc.com. In person, 1713 East Silver Springs Boulevard. Or give them a call, 352-566-8324. That's 352-566-8324. Ocala Mac and PC Repair. That was the sound of a tree falling. It could be your tree. You're going to have it trimmed, but never got around to calling Pride Tree Service. It could have fallen in a field, and now all you have to do is call Pride Tree Service, and they'll have it quickly out of the way for a great price. But don't wait until the tree falls. It may not fall in the field. It may hit your car, your house, or worse. So call Pride Tree Service today and avoid all those headaches before they happen. Pride Tree Service, 572-2510. That's 572-2510. Come to the 4th Annual Habitat Strawberry Festival on March 4th, 2017 at the McPherson Government Complex. The festival's goal is not only to have vendors, food, a car show, a kid's zone, live entertainment featuring one flight up, a lip sync competition, police versus fire department pie eating contests, and all things strawberry, but to also raise funds to build a habitat home for a family in our community. Check out the website, habitatocala.org, and follow the link. The Habitat for Humanity Strawberry Festival is March 4th with breakfast served at 7.30. Free parking, free admission. Want to go exploring with all the comforts of home? Discover the best of both worlds at the Ocala RV Show, March 2nd through 5th at Florida Horse Park. Thursday through Sunday, discover loads of RVs, great rates. Win two $100 gift cards every day, no purchase necessary. Adults $5, kids under 16 free. Thursday, buy one admission, get one free. Sunday, free admission with blood donation to Life South Community Blood Center. $2 off for military and first responders each day. It's the Ocala RV Show. All right, 23 minutes after 11 o'clock. Gosh, I, I love animals. We have this beautiful, we have a beautiful zoo over in Sanford. We've got yeah. this, a, the animal, what, what's the Disney thing called again? Animal Kingdom? Animal Kingdom, yeah. Oh my gosh. Bush Gardens. Such a great thing. Uh, I, next time I go, I have to wear a mask or something. <laughs> no, no, I heard I heard, I heard. heard Dr. Badisi say to you, Robin Othea, that he doesn't want to scare anybody. Just give us some right. information. And that, that seems to be what the whole message is here, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Sadesh Badisi, I hope I'm saying your name right, by the way. Way, down in Grenada at uh, the University St. George's University School of Veterinary Medicine. D real quickly, does the, the do diseases go the other direction? Do animals get our colds and our flus and things like that? Sure, it's, it's bidirectional. The same way we can receive pathogens from animals, the very same way they can receive from us as well. Uh -huh. So, what what is first of all? Do you have a book or do you have a website or something we can go to to learn more about maybe the one sure. uh, the One Health? movement or something? Sure. So we actually have a one-year course online. It's open access. It's free. It's online course going on throughout this year. 2017, St. George's University is celebrating our 40th anniversary. And each month of the year, we are presenting different topics, different faculty, different experts in all aspects of One Health and One Medicine. So persons can feel free to enroll in the course. You can just visit sg.edu. Or type in One Health, One Medicine at St. George's University or, or wh whichever way, and you will be directed to the course. You can also go on to what we call SGUX. SGUX is our online platform 
for delivering online courses and you can certainly choose that course to engage us on the topic one health one medicine throughout the year okay um i if we have a veterinarian in the audience i would love for a veterinarian to pick up on this and maybe share this with your clientele i don't i mean i i don't know mm-hmm. if any right of hand but but I'm, I'm thinking that'll be a great way to get to spread the word about this and also for veterinarians to work closer with physicians so let's say for example a client brings in a pet dog or a cat into the veterinary clinic and one of the veterinary concerns is ringworm on, on the skin surface of the animals well that's an area to treat the animal of course but it's also to recognize the exposure potential to humans and maybe work with the client to consult with their physician or even communicate with the physician indicating the potential risk associated with ringworm and see if the physician can actually detect or even if that's the case treat the ringworm infection in people so we have to work together that's the point of it that in because we are getting close to animals with the environment i mean animals over the over the ages have moved from the wild yeah. to the village to the backyard yeah to the house, to the bedrooms, to the cemeteries. So if you look at how we have engaged animals across the ages, we're getting closer and closer. You know, and the closer we get, is the more likely we are to share many things, including diseases. I wanted to bring up one area of animal, the animal kingdom that we kind of skipped over, I think, unless I was uh, paying, not paying attention. We had domestic animals, that's dogs, cats, whatever. Mm-hmm. We had wild animals, that's the lions, the tigers, and the... the ferrets. The, but what about the agricultural animals, the ones we eat... Are, yep. the, are, are we getting the diseases through their bodies? I mean, uh, you know what I mean? Through the eggs sure. and through the meat and things like that? That's a great question. And fortunately, before I respond to that, fortunately, the food industry have a lot of food safety and food security mechanisms in place. One example is what we call HACCP, or Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. And that's a mechanism that we use to control and regulate the the food safety aspect. Having said that, though, there is always evidence that exists of food of animal origin serving to be of a challenge to human health. We have an example. We have had examples in the past. We've had mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is a prion disease. And prions are... I mean, as far as we're aware, they're not living organisms, but these are protein organisms that is found in animals. And when you feed animals to animals or you, f- or you consume animal protein, you can be exposed. And we have linkages more with variant forms of Creutzfeldt jakob disease in humans that is linked to prion based diseases in animals. We also have other examples. We have parasitic infections. Misaginata, solium, which is tapeworm from from, from pigs and, 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 and cattle as well that we can be exposed to as these parasites complete the life cycles in humans after we are exposed to different stages of the parasites from animal sources of the food. So there are many examples by which production and agriculture is impacting human health. One of the main examples that is most current has to do with the fact that we are producing animal protein in large scales. So we now have what we call confined animal feeding operations, where we have hundreds of thousands of heads of animals in, in, in a given farm. What that is allowing is for infectious agents to enter into that animal population, and then by virtue of having many different individual animals to process through, these organisms can undergo genetic drifting and genetic shifting, which changes their virulence. Wow. And their virulence can also increase the pathogenicity. Yeah. And that has to do with even the flu. When we think about the flu season, every year we have new flus, outbreaks, and new flus to be concerned about. A lot of that has to do with genetic shifting and drifting, which is occurring in the viral particles, connected with their passage through different animal populations. Wow. You have given us so much information, Doctor. Thank you for doing that. I want to make sure the listeners have the website. I went to sgu.edu. That's St. George's University's website. So S-G-U dot E-D-U and uh, on there you can find so much information. The other website I have is cdc.gov slash One Health. Yes. And uh, I think there was a third one you gave us. What was the other one? Well, S-U-X, S-U-X, you can just Google S-U-X, 
which is our online platform to deliver online courses. Oh, okay. And okay. you have access to our free open access online courses. Okay. On uh, One Health and One Medicine. Dr. Sadeh Badisi, thank you so much for being on the air with us today. Good, really good stuff. We will be right back. Fox News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. The president, in his first speech before a joint meeting of Congress tonight, expected to touch on many campaign issues such as health care, which House Speaker Paul Ryan says Republicans will ultimately be unified on. We want to end the discrimination in the tax code against people who don't get health care to work and equalize the tax treatment of health care. The president now has a commerce secretary, billionaire investor Wilbur Ross, just sworn in, and a trip to Disneyland. And- 